Hello there, my friends. Welcome back to Silverfest. Great to be here with all of you today. And as you can see, quite excited to be joined by Ronan Manley of Bullion Star. I mean, it's it's just incredible some of the research Ronan does. Ronan, I was talking on the show the other night. I have this fantasy of you versus J.B. Morgan or the CFTC in the courtroom. <laughs> it would be like the Globetrotters against the Washington Generals. Um, so it's great to have you here. Talk some COMEX. How are you today, sir? Very good. I've been looking forward to this, and it's actually given me, uh, it spurred me to do a little bit of research about silver because I usually concentrate on gold. But what I found was that because in COMEX, uh, gold and silver are pretty much the same. So once you look at one, it's very easy to look at all the data for the other because they're all in the same places. So after this, maybe tomorrow or Monday, I'll write a blog maybe summarizing some of the stuff we touch on today. Well, I'll be looking forward to that, and I'll be darn glad right now that you're going to share it with us here first. So we've seen record COMEX delivery numbers in gold, in silver. Silver slowed down a little bit this month, uh, not a record. But um, A, what you're seeing, and also one question perhaps you can touch on in there, and I'll step out of the way and let you take it. Is any metal actually... It seems like it's not leaving the building yet. I don't even know if we're there shifting it over the imaginary line. But anyway, any if you could touch on that as well and uh, let us know what you're seeing. Okay. No, it's it's true that um, all of the gold and the silver that have been that have flowed into the vaults and that have been delivered via warrants between different people um, who are trading that pretty much has all remained in the vaults, so nothing has left yet. Um, but when it does, or if it does leave, it will become uh, interesting. So when you you gave me the topic of uh, which is uh, whether there is a run happening um, on comic silver, and the answer I think uh, conclusively is that of course yes there is, and it's been happening since around May, and then it accelerated into July, and even now into this month, the delivery month of September. But before we look at um, silver, I thought that there has been a lot of different parallels between COMEX gold and COMEX silver over this year. And this year, of course, has been totally unprecedented, both within wider financial markets and in the precious metal markets. So I hope that um, the viewers might be able to recall some of the, um, the quick things I'm going to say about the COMEX and LBMA gold markets since um, specifically the 23rd of March. So if you can remember back on the 23rd of March, there was a divergence between the LBMA spot gold price in London and the COMEX future gold prices. And it was a very wide divergence that happened on the 23rd and the 24th of March. Also, the LBMA's uh, bid ass spot spread uh, blew out on the same day. So that caused a very unprecedented development which was on the 24th of um, March, the LBMA and COMEX came out with a joint statement saying that they were jointly coordinating their support of the global gold market, which sounds ridiculous in some ways because they're two separate markets. And even though we as uh, precious metals analysts have always looked at them as the same entity in a way, that the fact that the bullion banks uh, control both really to a large extent, they had never really come out on record uh, together as one type of uh, entity. Um, and then another unprecedented thing happened the following week on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day of all days, when they, they came out with a second statement saying that they were uh, supporting the global gold market and they were coordinating to ensure that delivery obligations would be met. And that triggered a huge, um, the beginning of a huge inflow of physical gold into the Comex vaults in New York, which didn't let up. It was. It just happened in April, May, June, July, August, and overall, nearly 900 up to a thousand tons net have um, flowed into the COMEX vaults yeah, in gold. Um, and before we touch on the silver um, delivery contracts within gold, um, the active months are uh, June. What was it? June, August? No, May. May. Uh, no, April. June and August. And over those three months, there were about 540 tons delivered 
when I say delivered, what that means is that um, in COMEX, peop- the registered stocks represent warrants which are attached to gold bars. So when people talk about COMEX deliveries, what they're really meaning is that the warrants change hands for these bars which stay in the vaults and don't move. Um, and during that time as well, uh, COMEX and the LBA came out with this new um, enhanced delivery, enhanced gold contract called a 400 ounce contract, which hasn't traded, but what it did do was uh, uh, introduce the concept that um, the, the COMEX and the LBA were angling to have London delivery of COMEX contracts. So really that means that they could use gold in the London vaults to deliver against COMEX contracts. And the mechanism by which they do that, because the COMEX contract is a 100 ounce contract and the London good delivery system supports 400 ounce gold bars, that they divide the 400 ounce bar into four um, accelerated, they're called ACEs, they're accelerated certificates of exchange. So it's a paper concept. and what happened um, during that time as well, on the 27th of uh, July, COMEX mass approved a huge amount of LBMA good delivery refiner brands, both in gold and silver and both on the former and current good delivery list. So it looks like they're preparing for the mass um a mass change in which COMEX gold and silver contracts will be deliverable uh, in London. Um, so it, if you let me look at my um, notes, because this is a very uh, statistically driven subject with the COMEX vault warrants. and um, So I'm going to just look at my notes to give you a bit of a background. Sure, sure. Take your time there. And okay. so, um, if so, turning now to silver, um, whereas the the gold spot spread blew out at the end of March and was in the news a lot in the mainstream media, in uh, Reuters, in Bloomberg, and all the journalists were wondering what was going on with uh, the spot spread blowing out, and the official explanation from LBMA was that it was due to logistical reasons and they couldn't get gold in the right format to the right place at the right time, which seemed to be, it doesn't really make sense from my view. I My view is that there was an exchange for physical um, um, failure in London at the end of uh, March, which meant that the bullion banks, which had those obligations to whoever wanted uh, an exchange for physical, had to deliver gold to um, New York. And they already knew that the amount of gold that they would have to deliver. So they started delivering it as quickly as they could into April, May, and June. So that was in gold. But during that time, nobody was really looking at silver. And then the silver spot spread, the the spot spread between um, Comex Future Silver and LBMA spot silver started blowing out as well independently of gold in April and May and into June. And that took a lot of people off guard. And um, it started its own version of um, silver flowing into the COMEX vaults. Um, But there's a slight difference between the gold and silver COMEX uh, stocks because whereas the registered and eligible stocks of COMEX gold were quite low and they had to basically replenish it and really top it up a lot. There, there was quite a, a lot of uh, silver entries already in the vaults. Um, so what? So although um, maybe I think up to 1,500 tons of, go, of silver has been added to the, uh, the vaults since the end of May, um, there was a bigger change happening within the vaults where um, silver was moving from eligible to registered. So literally the, um, the silver stocks in COMEX dwindled between April down to the end of May, and then they started rising again in June. And then they rose significantly in June. And um, at the end of June was the first delivery day for the uh, July silver contract. And on that day, there was over, I think, 11,000 um, contracts stood for delivery. 
And that caused, I think, a shock um, across the market because JP Morgan had to move 30 million uh, ounces, which is about um, 900 tons, I think, from eligible to registered. Um, just to give a quick background to viewers about what the difference between eligible and registered means. Registered go gold and silver just means that there's already a warrant attached. It can be traded on COMEX or it has previously been traded on Eligible just refers to any gold or silver that is of the correct size, weight, and fineness, which happens to be in the vaults at, at that time, and the, the vault operators have to report to the COMEX. So eligible gold and silver doesn't necessarily mean that anyone who owns it wants to trade it. It could be owned by a refinery or a mint or a uh, jeweler. Um, so the fact that uh, they had to start uh, dipping into the eligible stocks of silver to uh, satisfy the, the contracts that were standing for delivery in July. It's very, um, I think it's one of the most critical points to take from this. And um, that, I think, triggered the LBMA and the uh, COMEX to expedite their plan to try and change the contract specifications to allow delivery from London vaults. So I think that um, looking at the, the topic we're talking about here, is there a run on, on silver? Yes, there is, and there has been, and it is continuing into September. We'll see what happens now in uh, the next active month, uh, December, where there's huge open interest right now. Um, but Unfortunately, we will have to wait a few months to see how that pans out. But I think what's happening behind the scenes is that the uh, CMA, or the um, COMEX and uh, LBMA, are now preparing for to, to change the rules, basically, to allow um, gold and silver to be delivered in London vaults. So if that is the case, it implies that a lot of the eligible silver in Comex vaults can't be brought into the registered, registered category and that registered holders don't want to let go of that registered stock. So does that uh, trigger any questions from you, Chris, about how, how you could see that the uh, approval, the mass approval of these refinery bands is due to the fact that um, the bullion banks are very in, a, in panic mode behind the scenes because they realize that another large uh, uh, stand for delivery month like July, even it could happen this month in September, although the open interest is low. But the fact that they're looking at December and really thinking that this isn't sustainable. Yeah, it did. <laughs> It's stunning. I wonder sometimes what these guys are actually thinking and be quite a hoot. Yeah, I don't know if there's any chance JP Morgan's going to invite you and I over to their desk to film an episode one of these days, which would be fun. Although, Ronan, I got a question I've been wanting to ask you since the last time we had you on the show. You talked about uh, how close you think this whole system is to breaking. Uh, now here we are a couple months later. How much longer do you think this can go on for? And if you care to put any sort of, uh, you can put a number if you choose, or even just describe whenever we hit the break point, what does that look like in silver? Well, I think it would be the same that happened in gold. It would cause panic among the authorities, the CME and the LBMA and the Bank of England and the Fed, the regulators, the CFTC. And I think back in the end of March, there was a lot of discussions going on behind the scenes. And obviously, they're not going to say that in the press release. But the fact that they coordinated a, a, a response to what was only a market mechanism uh, operating shows that the regulators and the Bank of England Fed must have been involved. And I actually submitted a freedom of information request to the Bank of England a few months ago, asking them, could they provide me with all the correspondence they had with the LBMA and the CME over the end of March and beginning of April? 
And they came back after about a month um, because they said that they hadn't got a lot of staff on duty. But they said that there was too much information to do a free freedom of information request and I'd have to pay for it because the volume of information was so huge that it would take a few people a whole week to do it. So that, I told Chris Powell about that and he said that in itself is worth reporting on because the fact that they couldn't even vote resources because there was so much information. So it just shows us there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. The journalists in... Um, Reuters and Bloomberg never ask about it because they never ask the real questions. Um, but I think that um, if there wasn't enough silver to uh, meet delivery requirements, i.e. warrants standing, or people standing for delivery of warrants, and if there was a, a large proportion of the eligible, which I call sticky, like it, it won't it doesn't want to move into registered, um, then they would have to start uh, bringing silver in from around the world physically into the vaults. And um, with mine closures back a few months ago in South America and so forth, that would have been more difficult. So I think it, it would lead to a situation where it would be very difficult to paper over the cracks. And um, hopefully during that, such a time, it would be possible to get the authorities to say something or other about the situation. And if they did say something, it would just prove that they're as worried about, they're worried about the price mechanism breaking and the price control of silver and gold as paper markets breaking, I think, overall. Is there some other possible way this ends? I can't figure it out. I mean, it, you know, is, is there another possible outcome or is this? Well, I was thinking back over the last few months because I was looking a lot at comics and LBMA and all the different mechanisms and comics. And for gold, because it's a long-term store of value, I was thinking that there must be hedge funds or institutions which have moved to want to own and possess three, four, five hundred 500 tons of gold in New York or elsewhere. And I was expecting that that would lead to outflows, like what they call loadout of the vault, where, you know, Brinks trucks come along and take the gold and bring it somewhere else because they don't need it to, to leave it in the, the comics vaults because they don't need to trade it if they're holding it for long-term investment. And that's something that myself and a few people, like a guy called Daniel Marsh, have been keeping an eye, out, an eye on, whether there are any outflows from these vaults. Um, but there hasn't been as of yet. And you would expect the same thing to be starting to happen with silver, that there would be loadouts of silver. If long-term silver investors want to take possession of silver as a long-term play, they don't need to keep it on comics. But unless they just have nowhere else to put it, so they just leave it in the vaults there. Um, so if there was the beginning of withdrawals of both gold and silver from the COMEX vaults, then that would be a really good indicator that things are changing. Yeah, well, Ronan, I sure appreciate that. And we have a few minutes left uh, as we're waiting for John Lee to get to the Silver Elephant booth, uh, Silver Elephant, one of the sponsors of today's show, where we're going to give away some silver Although, Ronan, I don't know if you see the chat room. There's a couple of tabs. One says backstage. There's also stage where yeah, people the stage. are yeah. asking questions. And uh, perhaps just to get the party started, if you uh, if you see anything that catches your eye and you'd like to toss it or pick a winner that I can give away an ounce of silver to, um, or you can take a question and we'll – Again, say thank you for Silver Elephant for making that possible. So, Ronan, question or pick someone. To see. Um, there was one uh, I saw a um, somebody called Jeremy Hatch says a very good point about they don't have as much as they say they have. And that's very true because in the comics, none of these vault reports, which they produce every day, are audited. Nobody knows if whatever is on the spreadsheet is accurate. It's just a spreadsheet. They do do one audit every year. In the CME rulebook, all of the approved vaults have to submit an independent audit to the CME group once a year. 
but they don't say what date that is, and they never produce any public version of those audits. So it's literally as uh, opaque as the London vaults, because the London vaults also don't do any independent audits, or they don't publish any independent audits. They only do um, an approval. Sorry, they only produce statistics uh, once a month. Oh, and that reminds me of an interesting question. About two weeks ago, LBMA moved from a, a three-month lag reporting their gold and silver vault holdings to a one-month lag. And I think what that it means, it, they're, they're trying to go halfway to um, appear more transparent. If they change the CME COMEX rules to allow London vault delivery, I don't think the London vaults will want to every day produce figures about how much gold and silver are in those vaults. So what they'll probably do is say, look, we went halfway to meet you. We changed it from three months to one month. Can you change the rules that mean that we only have to report once a month what's in the London vaults? Because they're very sensitive, very paranoid in London about what's in those vaults, even where those vaults are. They won't say. Yeah, they don't seem to like giving out information, which perhaps is why I'm so darn grateful that you are here, that you spend your time figuring out this stuff. I read your articles. I'm like, geez, how's a guy figure all these things out? And Well, I was hoping that I'd be able to translate, like, because a lot of the articles I do are quite in-depth, and uh, changing that into an audiovisual format to communicate it uh, is tough. But um, I um, will put this in a blog as well, and put the figures in the blog so people who have seen today's uh, webcast can go back and refer to the figures. And I'll put in all the tonnages that have flowed through the vaults, that have changed from registered to eligible, that have stood for delivery, because then it all makes sense. Um, well, Ronan, I sure appreciate that. People can find your research at bullionstar.com. And it's pretty darn impressive. Um, I'm also excited. You have a new podcast that you've started. I was listening to you and then Nader Leyland a couple of weeks. That's ago. right. We're 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 starting again the Bullion Star Perspective series, which has always been um, around, but it, we didn't have some for a while now. We didn't have new content, but we're starting again. And we had one with Ned Naylor Leyland, and I recorded one during the week just gone with Chris Powell, which is very interesting. And um, that's going to be up uh, early this week, early next week. And I've got a lot of uh, potential guests that are going to be joining us over the coming months. Well, I sure appreciate that, Ronan. You can find them at bullionstar.com. And Ronan, if you have a couple extra minutes, um, we're going to log off here for now. I'm going to get Andrew McGuire. I believe he is in the backstage Although, so we'll be about 10 minutes behind the schedule. But Ronan, if you'd like to join us in the Silver Elephant booth after Andrew's done, we can uh, love to introduce you to John from Silver Elephant. We can give away some silver ounces there. And if cool. you're like taking questions from anyone, uh, I think it'd be actually a very interesting conversation with you and John. So thank you again for being here. And uh, we will log off for a second. But... Ronan Manley, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you again, sir. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It's great.